Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Galazuski. I'm a Partner Relations Director with Eversight. And on behalf of everyone at Eversight, I would like to thank you for joining tonight's program, DMEC Complications Management and Patient Selection. In an effort to eliminate all background noise, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by typing your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Lorenzo Cervantes is a board certified ophthalmologist and a fellowship trained specialist in cornea, external disease, cataract and refractive surgery. Dr. Cervantes received his medical degree cum laude from the Downstate Medical Center College of Medicine and at the State University of New York, where he was elected a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. He completed his residency in ophthalmology at the North Shore LIJ Health System in New York, where he also served as the chief resident. He completed a fellowship in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery at the Eye and Ear Institute of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. His clinical practice interests include the medical and surgical management of corneal diseases, small incision and complex cataract surgery, repair of intraocular lenses and refractive surgery, including LASIK. He is experienced in the most advanced corneal transplant procedures, including DMEC, DSEC, DALC, and the use of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Dr. Cervantes is an experienced and accomplished surgeon, having performed several thousand intraocular procedures and was the first surgeon to perform DMEC for the treatment of corneal edema in Connecticut in March of 2015. Dr. Cervantes is a diplomat of the American Board of Ophthalmology and a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons, the Connecticut Society of Eye Physicians, the New England Ophthalmological Society, the International Society of Refractive Surgery, the Cornea Society, the Patent Society, and the Eye Bank Association of America. He currently serves on the board of directors for Eversight and regularly teaches other surgeons advanced techniques in corneal transplantation and cataract surgery. On the subject of cornea, he has authored several textbook chapters and peer reviewed journal articles and has lectured both at national and international meetings. In October of 2017, Dr. Cervantes joined Dr. Joseph Sokol at Connecticut Eye Specialists in Shelton, Connecticut to help provide some of the most up-to-date cornea and cataract care in the region. When not practicing medicine, Dr. Cervantes enjoys golfing, running, snowboarding, and watching football games with his family. Dr. Cervantes, you can, I don't know when you find time to sleep, but you can, uh, you can go ahead and begin. <laughs> Thanks for that, for that great introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lorenzo. Um, uh, it's a beautiful night here in uh, the Northeast in Connecticut. I hope it is where you are as well. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, transitioning to DMEC, uh, patient selection and complication management. Always a favorite topic of mine. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Eversight for the past five or six years, as Michelle just described. Um, and uh, uh, we're happy to uh, join uh, that you are joining us on this mission as well. Uh, my time is volunteered, so I don't have any relevant uh, financial conflicts to disclose. Uh, for those of you, uh, you know, who haven't made the move to DMEC, tonight I hope we, to convince you that learning and offering it is worthwhile. Uh, then we'll uh, go over some pearls that will make the transition a successful one. And everyone's favorite subject, we'll go over some of the complications unique to DMEC uh, so that your learning curve might be faster than mine. We'll do this all by briefly going over the history of uh, endothelial keratoplasty, going over the evidence-based benefits of DMEC, um, addressing uh, the transition concerns some surgeons might have, uh, as well as the fundamentals that we should keep in mind when we're performing DMEC. Uh, then we'll spend the majority of the time going over complications uh, and their management. Um, now, uh, 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 we'll also, uh, uh, now this talk is a, is a variation of the talk that I, I give for Eversight's virtual wet lab, uh, which I'll plug at the very end. Uh, now, first, let me introduce you to Garrett Mellis. Uh, this is the godfather of DMEC and endothelial keratoplasty. You know, if you ever meet him or see him, you know, please be sure to shake his hand. 
Now, endothelial keratoplasty is one of the greatest leaps forward uh, in the history of cornea surgery. You know, all within the last 20 years, um, uh, it's proven infinitely superior to penetrating keratoplasty in the treatment of endothelial dysfunction, you know, in terms of quality of vision, speed of recovery, you know, and, and complications. Uh, its superiority is reflected, you know, by the adoption of cornea surgeons. And in 2012, uh, DSEC overtook uh, penetrating keratoplasty as the, the most commonly performed cornea transplant in the United States, uh, with that gap ever widening. Now, endothelial dysfunction is the most common indication for keratoplasty in the United States. Um, and within endothelial keratoplasty, um, we also see an, an interesting trend uh, up here in the top right, uh, where the use of DMEC is increasing, uh, this green line is increasing at a much faster rate uh, than DSEC is declining. Uh, this might be explained by the growing numbers of recent cornea fellows uh, who are now joining the ranks uh, offering DMEC as their endothelial keratoplasty of choice. You know, for those of us uh, who have not offered DMEC to our patients yet, uh, it's often cited uh, that iatrogenic uh, donor tissue damage, um, a steep learning curve, and uh, increased rebubble rates have been barriers uh, to transitioning to DMEC. Uh, I'd like to offer some reassurance that, you know, this, uh, that the symbiotic relationship uh, that we cornea surgeons have uh, with our eye banks um, have alleviated, you know, many of these concerns. You know, so why should we start offering DMEC? Um, or why was it even, uh, you know, why, why is it, uh, you know, so important for us? Really, it's for the benefit of our patients, right? Everything we do is for the benefit of our patients. You know, compared to even DSEC, uh, DMEC has been shown to uh, get better visual acuities, you know, uh, uh, faster visual recovery, and even lower rejection rates. And uh, because of, uh, of even better chances of getting to 2020, uh, and because of lower higher order aberrations, uh, patients with premium IOLs might still be able to achieve their goals, uh, like this patient uh, who got multifocal IOLs despite having a history of advancing Fuchs dystrophy. You know, and this is a, um, you know, this video shows a patient who has gotten DMEC. Their corneas are very clear uh, and they're doing, you know, very well. Uh, the, uh, the eye banks really have been a godsend in terms of, you know, tissue preparation and shortening the length of OR time, you know, two major concerns that, that surgeons had, you know, in the, um, in the acceptance of DMEC. Uh, they're ascent, the eye banks are essentially doing the first part of the surgery, uh, which involves the tissue harvesting and the tissue preparation. Um, you know, the highly, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the staff are highly trained and will have prepared more DMEC tissue than any of us cornea surgeons will ever do. Uh, decreasing tissue waste, uh, primary graft failure, uh, and OR time. You know, aside from peeling the endothelial graft, the eye bank technicians also provide orientation markings uh, to your preference and preload the graft in either of two glass injectors. Uh, that's the, uh, the Dork tube, which I prefer uh, and use, and the, um, uh, the Jones Strico tube. Uh, this allows uh, the surgeons to perform uh, DMEC efficiently um, you know, prepare the eye, inject the graft, unfold it, um, stick it with a bubble, get in, get out, you know, very repeatable, um, you know, very efficient procedure. Let's go over uh, some things to keep in mind uh, that will help, you know, with uh, your DMEC success. Uh, this, uh, you know, DMEC, uh, as uh, many of us are learning and teaching it is essentially a no-touch technique. Um, you know, we uh, uh, 
um, because the graft comes to us uh, already preloaded, we never really even have to touch the graft. Um, and all the tapping and manipulation that we do is through the cornea, which create fluid waves that push and pull the edges of the graft. Um, as we watch this video, um, uh, you might see that, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, you know, teaching one of my colleagues how to do DMEC, and you'll see deliberate taps that I'm describing to my colleague, almost calling the shots, um, and, and how I'm going to manipulate uh, the graft while we're, um, um, uh, you know, unfolding it. Um, everything is very deliberate here, you know, and each tap almost seems to have, um, you know, a, a purpose in mind. Uh, we also know that uh, endothelial cell count is not affected by how long it takes to unfold the graft. You know, so patience is, is really key. Um, you know, if we're struggling to unfold the graft, um, really just take a breath, sit back, relax, take our time. It, it's very common uh, for us to, um, you know, struggle a little bit, uh, feel like an hour has passed, uh, but yet maybe only five minutes have passed, you know? Um, uh, a great study was shown, um, you know, by Chris Salas that, um, you know, there's really no significant endothelial cell loss in, in um, you know, in graphs that took five minutes versus an hour to unfold. Um, uh, also, older graphs uh, unfold easier, you know, so if you're getting started, ask for tissue that's older than 60 years old. Uh, they unfold almost uh, re really readily, even within the injector. Uh, and in case you're uh, worried about age, age doesn't affect endothelial cell loss uh, in, uh, in transplants. Um, the eye bank also places an orientation marker on the graft, like an S or, or a one and two mark. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so that you can clearly know which way is up. Um, and probably the most important thing to ever, never, ever forget uh, is to always make an adequately sized inferior peripheral iridotomy to prevent uh, pupillary block. And you can do that either preoperatively or intraoperatively. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the easiest cases uh, to uh, perform DMEC are phacic patients. You know, their anterior chambers shallow very easily, um, making unfolding, you know, a breeze. Um, uh, one, uh, um, you know, one might make the case that this is actually where you should start, you know, performing DMEC. You know, the, the bulk of the crystalline lens pushes the iris forward, allowing the anterior chamber to, uh, to shallow. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it really is quite easy, but they're few and far between, you know. So most people will start performing DMEC in pseudophagic Fuchs patients um, with normal axial lengths. And, you know, that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, once you're feeling confident uh, performing DMEC uh, in these patients, uh, and if you're confident, you know, with your cataract surgeries, um, you might start combining, uh, you know, triple procedures, cataracts with DMEC. Uh, but, you know, just, uh, you know, be, uh, be wary there that uh, you're, uh, you're performing these types of surgeries, you know, in normal axial length eyes, uh, they can become a little bit challenging, you know, in, in longer axial length myopes. Um, now, I routinely see my patients at one day, one week, and one month, you know, and uh, each visit has their purpose. You know, at, at one day, uh, the most important things to me are the pressure and the bubble size. Um, I certainly want to make sure that they're not in pupillary block uh, and that, uh, they're, uh, that their air fluid level has cleared the PI. Um, at one week, uh, the most important thing to me is that the graft is attached. Uh, fortunately, in my practice, we have an anterior segment OCT uh, that we can uh, check uh, for graft attachment. But if you don't have an anterior segment OCT, it's okay. Um, very frequently, you can kind of tell, um, even just by asking the patient how their experience has been over the last few days, uh, whether or not the graft is trending towards detachment. Um, if uh, the patient says that they started to see once the bubble was gone, 
and every day is a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. If you look at the graft and there's a little bit of a detachment, you, you can be reasonably assured that they are doing well and you don't have to worry about them so much. But if they uh, come back at a week, uh, they say they start to, that they had started to see better when the bubble was gone. Uh, and they start to say that, you know what, I'm starting to get a little bit foggier and foggier. Um, it might be that that graft is trending towards um, a larger detachment, even though they might not look as um, uh, uh, detached uh, at the slit lamp, and they might be a reasonable candidate for rebubble. You know, at the uh, you know at that time. Um, at one month, um, I'm uh, removing the suture at that time, uh, and also uh, starting the taper of steroids. Um, very often, patients uh, come at their one month. Uh, with a large improvement in their, uh, in their vision. All right, so what cases do I not uh, offer DMEC? Um, well, maybe an eye like this. You know, I wouldn't recommend this eye being your first DMEC case. Uh, the view is terrible. Uh, there's a large irregular pupil, a large iridectomy, an anterior chamber uh, IOL. Uh, we could very easily lose the graft posteriorly here. Uh, or, or traumatize the graft against the lens. Um, and it probably won't hold the bubble in the anterior chamber very well. Uh, so this eye, you know, this kind of eye, uh, would be a great case for a DSEC. You know, and uh, in a, a situation like this, uh, there really is no significant visual advantage for DMEC versus DSEC, at least in my own experience. Uh, other uh, types of cases where DMEC might be challenging are in uh, you know, patients who have had uh, you know, prior vitrectomy uh, uh, or um, high axial length myopes. And uh, this, uh, those types of eyes, it, it can be very difficult uh, to shallow or flatten the anterior chamber uh, to uh, facilitate graft unfolding. So uh, in summary of, 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 uh, uh, of what we just talked about, um, the eye banks make it really easy for us to adopt DMEC at this point. Some of our prior concerns of uh, graft damage, long uh, OR time, um, um, you know, uh, that has been essentially taken out of our hands uh, and, uh, and done very well by our eye banks. Um, you know, DMEC does not completely uh, eliminate DSEC from our, uh, from our repertoire. And there still is a place for DSEC, like in complicated uh, anterior segments. Um, and in case you didn't know now, you know, now's a great time uh, to accept DMEC. Um, it's ready. You know, and, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, everyone uh, can learn this procedure. All right. Um, I'll move on to complications. Uh, and uh, we're, we're here we're going to talk uh, about, well, when, we, when I discuss complications, I, I tend to describe it uh, in terms of when they occur. Um, uh, in terms of DMEC, complications can occur when we're preparing the graft, um, intraoperatively during uh, uh, DMEC, and uh, postoperatively as well. Uh, so when we're preparing the graft, uh, this is the uh, this uh, this video is when um, I was preparing my own tissue, and if you watch carefully, this is where I'm tearing the peripheral rim. Um, of decimase away from the graft. And I slowed this down so you can catch what, what happens here. I think I'm peeling the peripheral rim, but oh no, I've, I've torn the graft completely in half. Um, the, um, you know, in a situation like this, I actually had uh, a, a te some text training in the OR and a few um, uh, re uh, reps in the OR. And I just listened to a talk um, about uh, performing hemi -DMEC. Uh, So. You know, uh, I had some time to catch my breath, you know, take a seat back, uh, explain what I was about to do, which essentially was just use half of the transplant. Um, you know, I, uh, I, was, I took the half that had the S on it, so I didn't have to worry about uh, orientation markings or, or which way was up. Um, surprisingly, I, uh, uh, I found that the graft was able to unfold, you know, just as easily as a, as a full, um, you know, a full graft. Uh, and, um, you know, as I'm explaining uh, what hemi-DMEC was, um, nobody was 
you know, any worse for wiser, you know, in, in the OR and, uh, you know, everybody took it to be something that I intentionally did. Um, in, uh, you know, just after this, uh, we'll see that uh, the, uh, the graph rebubbled beautifully centered. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was actually, you know, one of my first 10 DMET cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, five, six years later, she's still completely clear. So despite something as traumatic as uh, tearing a graft in half, uh, you can still make the best of, of something like that. Um, as long as you uh, kind of, uh, well, I, I, I had a little bit of background information there, but I was still able to salvage it, okay. Um, before we inject the, uh, the graft, um, the, uh, uh, you know, actually here on the, uh, uh, at the top here, I'm, I'm starting to, uh, this is my, one of my first experiences with the, uh, uh, with the Doric injector. I was still getting a feel for it. Um, uh, and, uh, I had inadvertently, um, ejected a preloaded graft, um, and uh, you know, fortunately, I was doing this over a uh, a, a jar of or a lid of filled with BSS, uh, and that's one of the important things to keep in mind. That uh, to keep in mind that if there was to be an accident, uh, make sure it happens over somewhere safe, uh, and that this graft is always wet and uh, and uh, findable. You know, um, fortunately, uh, you know, I had uh, uh, figured out how to disassemble and reassemble the injector. And I encourage all of you uh, get comfortable with doing something like this in case something like this ever happens. Um, but, you know, preloaded doesn't always mean, um, you know, perfect. Uh, so, uh, you know, even though it was loaded perfectly, you know, it was in my own hands that I, uh, you know, sort of inadvertently ejected this graft. Uh, and the bottom right here, um, the, uh, you know, prior to preloaded uh, tissue and, uh, I was preparing this graft. Uh, here I'm lifting up the graft and uh, you know, on that uh, rim, I stain it with uh, vision blue. I go back to the patient to uh, you know, remove viscoelastic while it's staining to save some time. And uh, when I came back to that graft, I realized that my scrub tech had knocked over uh, my, uh, my punch. And I came back to a puddle of vision blue on the drape. Um, somewhere in there is the graft, um, but it was, wet, it was in a puddle, um, and in diluting it, uh, we were able to find it. Um, so in, uh, in knowing how to load the injector, we essentially folded this, uh, this drape to create a, a more manageable pool. Uh, and from this little puddle, um, we were able to draw the graft into the injector uh, and uh, proceed normally, um, like a, a, a normal case. And again, you know, this patient you know, did well um, because we got lucky and this graft never dried out and it uh, um, you know, remained viable. All right, intraoperative, uh, uh, you know, some intraoperative complications, um, you know, we always have to make a peripheral iridotomy. And uh, for, for many of my cases, uh, I uh, perform uh, peripheral iridotomies intraoperatively uh, because um, the, uh, it was just more convenient for the patient uh, to not have to come back to the office uh, to, uh, you know, to perform a YAG uh, iridotomy. Um, but then occasionally we'll run into something like this. You know, there is a, a large iris vessel there is a large iris vessel uh, at uh, six o'clock uh, that if you're not uh, you know, aware of it or, or can you know, see it and avoid it, um, you can create a, a big hemorrhage like this. And a hemorrhage like this can be extremely inconvenient um, because the anterior chamber can fill up with blood. The, uh, the iridotomy can clog, you know, even though you've made a, a, a decent sized one uh, and fibrin will form in the anterior chamber. And that fibrin can act as glue uh, that can prevent your graft from unfolding uh, and prevent you and, and cause your graft to stick in the angle. Um, you know, extremely inconvenient. Uh, so the, uh, the way to manage something like this is one, prevent it. Don't perform 
interoperative iridotomies. Uh, but if you do encounter bleeding like, uh, like this, um, you know, uh, put viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, you know, right above the iridotomy and the source of the bleeding. And what that will do is to temp and nod the bleeding and stop the bleeding from coming forward. You know, I would rather have the blood collect behind the iris here. Um, uh, you know, fill the, uh, the eye, not to, you know, the NLP vision, but high enough uh, uh, pressure that it'll tamponade the bleeding, stop the bleeding if possible, then leave, you know, finish what, you know, what you can do away from the eye, uh, which, uh, you know, is like uh, putting your, your injector together. Uh, and by the time you come back, the blood will have, uh, the blood will have coagulated, stopped. Um, you can do your IA at that point. Uh, just verify that your iridotomy is patent, and then proceed and um, inject your graft, you know, as you normally would. Uh, you know, the bleeding time might might be a little bit longer for patients who are on anticoagulation, um, but that would be another reason, you know, to uh, try to avoiding uh, to try to avoid this in the first place and do uh, peripheral iridotomies preoperatively, uh, preoperatively using a YAG. All right, um, this is, insertion and ejection is uh, when we uh, inject the graft, uh, this is how it should be done. You know, we, the, uh, you know the anterior chamber has a low pressure. Uh, we are always engaging the, uh, the injector um, you know, to the wound. Uh, and even though the graft is inside the eye, I'm not letting up on the, uh, uh, on the engagement. Um, once the graft is in the eye, I have to depressurize the anterior chamber. I'm using a, my non-dominant hand to uh, open up the paracentesis to depressurize, make sure that the graft is well away from the main incision. Uh, and then I'm going to guard the main incision with my, uh, with my second instrument to prevent the graft from coming forward. Down below um, in this video, um, what I've done is uh, I'm engaged, I'm inserting the graft, I'm talking to somebody right now, and um, I'm, in, I'm uh, not paying attention to how pressurized the anterior chamber actually is. So as the graft goes in, you know, my movements are, are touching the paracentesis, but I'm not letting any fluid out. I'm not paying attention to uh, how, uh, uh, how deep the chamber still is and the pressure is still high. So when I move to disengage, the graft starts to come out and I'm stuck. The graft is wedged in between my injector and uh, and the wall of the cornea, and I'm you know I made a mistake there by trying to inject BSS to push the graft back in, but all that's doing is pressurizing the anterior chamber, uh, and uh, I'm you know I realize what I what I have to do is is um, uh, uh, you know right there I just sort of you know took a leap of faith depressurize the anterior chamber, um, made sure that the anterior chamber pressure was zero. And then disengaged, you know the the graft will always follow the path of least resistance. Um, and uh, you know what what you saw me do there at the very end uh, was really the only thing one could do is just very gently kind of tuck it back in, you know. And uh, you know it doesn't have to be a traumatic experience for the graft, um, but this is uh, something that care really has to be uh, taken. This is one of the areas where uh, excess manipulation of the graft will cause. Um, uh, you know, graft failure. All right, difficulty dancing. It's not really a complication, and, but uh, just more, uh, you know, uh, uh, where frustration can get to you. Um, some things to keep in mind are that if you want the graft to unfold, you have to flatten the chamber. The iris has to push the graft up against the cornea and stop it from re-scrolling. Uh, similarly, that if you want the, uh, the, the scroll to move, let's say it's tucked into the, uh, uh, tucked into the angle, you have to deepen the angle, uh, rather deepen the angle, deepen the uh, anterior chamber, allow it to scroll to some degree, uh, and then push it uh, or tap it you know, centrally. Um, if you have an open graft that's decentered, uh, sometimes tapping the limbus you know, way out you know, will, will uh, accomplish two things. It'll temporarily transiently deepen the chamber um, while um, pushing the graft and that'll get a, a, a wide, you know, an unfolded graft uh, to move. 
Uh, and if you happen to see, um, like in the top there, that instead of, uh, if you use the S stamp, if you see, instead of an S, you see a, um, a two, uh, then um, uh, you can use uh, fluid to kind of puff it or blow it open. Uh, and likewise, there's, uh, there are some configurations that are more challenging than others to unfold. Um, if you're ever stuck, um, it's a great um, idea to use a puff of fluid to reshuffle, you know, reorganize the, uh, the graft into something that might be you know, more manageable. You know, and if you, um, uh, you know, want some ideas on this, um, uh, go to patientready.org. Uh, uh, Dr. Boldman has this uh, great um, strategies on, on tissue unfolding. Uh, that uh, you know have been extremely helpful for countless surgeons. Um, gas or air misdirection or bubble misdirection. Uh, this can be a frustrating problem too. You know, after un after finally unfolding the graft, um, after getting it centered, um, and you you place your bubble under the graft, uh, what what might happen? if the eye isn't pressurized the right way is that that bubble can sneak behind the iris uh, and that'll cause the iris to come forward and uh, you know, uh, uh, close the angle. This is not a desirable configuration. Um, and uh, the most frustrating part about this is that if air does get behind the iris, the only way to get it out of there is to um, get it all out, get it out of the anterior chamber, um, uh, break the block that uh, the lens might have on the iris, like here, um, and it'll eventually come forward. But you really, you know, uh, you, you might really just have to start over again, you know. So the way to uh, prevent this uh, is to, uh, once you get your graft flattened, um, use a small air bubble, a really small controlled air bubble to lift the graft against the cornea. Uh, that way, it'll stay unfolded um, and it won't move. Uh, and then pressurize the eye with BSS. You know, so that way, the posterior chamber is full. Um, if the posterior chamber is soft, uh, air will want to go back there. Again, it'll just go wherever there's least resistance. So if the posterior chamber is full of BSS, there's not going to be any volume for air. The air will stay in the anterior chamber. All right, with partial graft detachments, uh, let's say you know they come back at a week, uh, you, there's a, a clinically significant uh, detachment. Um, you know, bubbles, uh, rebubbling is, uh, uh, has been something that uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, you know, surgeons uh, find unappealing. You know, it, it's sort of like a, uh, I've failed, you know, uh, you know it, it mark of failure, but we know that 10% of, of, um, of grafts need rebubbling. Uh, and that's not an insignificant amount. Um, so we really have to accept the fact that some of these grafts do need rebubbling uh, and will need rebubbling. Uh, and it's just a fact of DMAC life, you know? Uh, I, I perform, um, I, you know, I rebubble my patients at the slit lamp, um, uh, you know, as long as it's a partial detachment uh, and, uh, and the detachment is, um, uh, lamellar, and I know that if I can get the, the tip of my needle behind the graft, um, then uh, I'm not going to dislodge it. You know, I have had the unfortunate uh, experience where in, um, in, in rebubbling th these patients supine, uh, as these bubbles enter the uh, AC, as, as you'll see in the video down there, as the bubbles rise, it can actually drag uh, uh, a uh, a large inferior, you know, detachment, and drag it up and, and completely dislodge uh, the, uh, you know, the graft. So in large inferior detachments, I actually prefer to uh, rebubble these patients uh, lying down, uh, supine. Um, but uh, for most of my uh, my my grafts, I'll I'll do this at the slit lamp sitting up. Um, you can do this however you want. I just happen to uh, uh, prefer it this way. Um, the uh, uh, in, in rebubbling these patients, I'll inject air into the anterior chamber. Um, the pressure in the eye is gonna go up. Then I'll move the tip of my needle back into the fluid level 
inferiorly and then draw out BSS or rather draw out aqueous. In drawing out the aqueous, the bubble, the, uh, the bubble is going to expand uh, because the pressure inside the eye is going to uh, reduce. Uh, and you can have pretty much a 90% uh, air fill uh, with, with, um, um, with good apposition uh, with one needle stick, you know, even in the, uh, the sitting position. All right, complete graft detachments. Fortunately, this doesn't happen all that often. Um, but uh, if you do find this, um, this is not something that's amenable to uh, rebubbling in the office because it, it might be completely scrolled. There's no way to guarantee that it's going to be centered. Uh, but uh, uh, these have to go back to the operating room. Um, um, once you're in the operating room, uh, one of the challenges here and considerations is this something that you can actually uh, reattach or recenter. Um, but often, uh, unless the uh, S stamp is, you know, clearly still there, um, it can be very difficult to determine which way is up. Um, you can try to restain the uh, the graft in, in the anterior chamber using Vision Blue. Um, but uh, you know, in the couple of times this has happened to me, I've just uh, replaced the graft altogether. You know, it's uh, you know it's uh, you know less stressful. Uh, there's less of uh, uh, question in my mind of, you know, if, did I put it the right way? Is this going to continue working? Um, you know, and, and that's what I would probably recommend uh, you do as well. All right, pupillary block is uh, probably the worst complication uh, that uh, one can run into. Uh, and one that is totally preventable. Well, mostly preventable. There are, uh, um, I say almost totally preventable because as long as you make a good size PI, um, uh, I mean a really good size, we're not talking one you know, for, a, you know, for a narrow angle glaucoma where you can get away with like a small um, you know, iridotomy. Um, but even if you're making one with a YAG, you really want this to be quite uh, significantly large. Um, because uh, when, if you do leave a patient with a, a, a large air bubble, like a 95 or uh, you know, 100% uh, air bubble at the end of your DMEC, um, it's possible that the PI might still be occluded you know, and, and they might uh, you know, get a block from that. Uh, so make your iridotomies large enough uh, that, um, uh, uh, that fluid can confidently uh, traverse that. Um, I make my I make uh, PIs uh, preoperatively uh, uh, with my YAG, um, and at the end of the case, I also dilate my patients uh, to uh, you know to make sure that even the pupil gets big enough to um, you know to um, you know to clear the fluid level you know at a certain point. Um, you know to manage something like this, uh, it's important uh, that you manage this uh, you know uh, swiftly. Um, uh, my patients have instructions to uh, call me, um, uh, you know, overnight should they start to experience symptoms of, uh, you know, uh, building pressure, uh, building headaches, um, uh, especially around the eye you know, and the brow, um, you know, and if uh, I won't hesitate to go in and see them in the middle of the night, uh, just to make sure that they are not in block. And if they are in block, uh, you know, take, for example, this patient uh, who was in block, um, their cornea is very hazy, cloudy, you know, as you'd expect. Uh, and um, within a few minutes of burping that, um, uh, burping that, in, uh, you know, one of the paracentesis to, uh, to break the block and lower the pressure, uh, these, these corneas will clear, um, um, you know, within a day or so, um, you know, because the pressure is then normal. All right. So this is really something to look out for. I can't stress this enough. If the pressure is too high for too long, patients will have permanent vision loss. Um, I include endophthalmitis here, you know, because even though we can get endophthalmitis from any intraocular surgery, um, uh, there is uh, evidence that shows that um, performing fungal donor rim cultures um, have a, a uh, about a 10% positive predictive value for fungal uh, endophthalmitis. 
So, um, you know, when even if you get a preloaded uh, tissue, uh, it comes with a section of the uh, donor sclera uh, that is meant to be sent for uh, culture. Uh, I don't send for bacterial culture. I do send for fungal cultures for this reason. Um, and in case you do get a, a, a positive fungal culture, um, you know, follow these patients closely. You know, that is a pretty high positive predictive value, you know, for, a, you know, for a, an elective surgery. Um, and should there be any infiltrates that arise, especially in, in the interface uh, or any, um, you know, uh, sort of inflammation uh, that doesn't have a, a, a good reason, um, you know, consider starting antifungal treatment at the earliest signs. Uh, you certainly don't want this to get out of control. All right, so, you know, invariably, you know, complications will occur. Um, it's just part of being a surgeon. Um, uh, but, you know, now that you have at least a few of these uh, complications, um, you, know, uh, you know, shown to you, uh, and in discussing uh, cases with other DMEC surgeons with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of experience, um, hopefully you'll be able to recognize uh, and then manage these complications before they become a serious problem. Uh, and believe me, you know, um, you know, DMEC is a lot more forgiving than you realize. All right. Just keep that in mind. Um, you know, that said, uh, you know, if you haven't already um, done so and, um, and, and would like to participate in uh, one of these, uh, uh, you know, great virtual wet labs that uh, Eversight offers, uh, you know, with the pandemic, uh, we, um, we, we did want to have, you know, before the pandemic, we did uh, and, and had active uh, DMEC surgical education live and in person, you know, through wet labs. But with the, uh, you know, with um, the, the inability to travel and meet in person, uh, one of the things that we had actually developed was a way to um, use uh, Zoom and smartphone technology uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, virtually educate and virtually uh, learn, um, you know, live. Uh, uh, this has been uh, really well received. Um, and uh, if you're interested in something like this, you know, reach out to, uh, to Michelle. Uh, we are, uh, uh, we've actually uh, published um, our experience, our initial experience with this in cornea, and that should be coming out in the next month or two. Um, the, uh, you know, we'll go over, you know, basically how to use uh, the, uh, the injectors, um, how to and and how to use uh, rather how to uh, unfold um, and unscroll um, you know DMEC graphs in a uh, uh, an artificial surgical practice system, uh, and again that's been you know, pretty well received. Um, uh, there's a oh well there was a video there of of yeah so this video is uh, um, you know the view of you know, one of our participants that we're, uh, you know, that uh, we were coaching, um, you know, basically in this time lapse where um, we're going over, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, where to make incisions and uh, how to hold uh, the, you know, the injector and, and where's the ideal place to place the, uh, the graft, you know, within the tube. Um, and even though we're, uh, we're not, uh, you know, in the same room together, it's like I can see what this, what this surgeon is actually doing, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and, and the, uh, you know, in, in coaching them and, and in doing this, um, uh, you know, more than you know, several times, we got to get the hang of, of um, um, you know, where, you know, what works, what doesn't work, um, you know, what, you uh, um, you know, and sort of overcome like what we, you know, would be able to uh, achieve easily in person. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, this surgeon actually did great. You'll see that, you know, uh, she was able to unfold this graft um, and, and manipulate it on her, on her first try. Uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully we, you know, the, uh, uh, if you choose to do something like this, that, that'll be your experience too. Uh, we actually have a wet lab coming up uh, next uh, that's next weekend um, with a star studded cast of, of uh, you know, proctors. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope to see you there.
And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this webinar. Um, good luck with your um, uh, uh, with your, you know, with your transition, uh, and good luck to your patients as well. Yeah, thanks for uh, spending it here. Dr. Cervantes, we do have a couple of questions. If anyone else would like to, just enter your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen and we will address them now. Uh, so first question is from Dr. Jalaj. Do you inject the graft with life force c or do you inject out all the life force c and fill the dork tube with BSS? Do you think it matters? Oh, great question. I, uh, um, you know, at, by the end of, uh, of the injection, you might find that the anterior chamber, you know, is full of life force C or the, uh, uh, or the um, uh, you know, previously optazole. Um, but by the time you um, uh, sort of dilute and, um, uh, you know, sort of unfold the graft with, you know, that, that eventually gets diluted out. Now I will tell you what I do in practice. In practice, what I actually do is, is um, you know, very carefully under under uh, you know in a lid of BSS, I will draw BSS into the injector, you know, carefully so that the graft stays in the wide portion of of the injector, and so it just sort of um, floats there. And I'll fill and dilute the uh, the life force C um, within the injector so that there's less that I have to dilute once it's inside the eye. Um, you know, it, it's a very uh, simple and straightforward, you know, slow, slow drawing up, um, you know, movement. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I think that's something that, you know, that I find useful and, and uh, easy to do so that I don't have to worry about it afterwards. Okay, next question is to re, uh, from Dr. Crane. To rebubble at the slit lamp, do you go through your paracentesis or use a needle to make a new incision? Oh, good. Another good question. I, uh, I use a needle um, and I do not go through a paracentesis. Um, um, I find that, you know, after prepping the eye, uh, after anesthetizing the eye, um, I'm doing everything that I can to, you know, keep the sterile field and not introduce, you know, any micro, you know, possible microorganisms in a semi-sterile field, you know, at the slit lamp. Um, so my, uh, my 30 gauge needle is, is, is going through conjunctiva, going through just, you know, when I say conjunctiva, I mean, I'm really going through like as close to the limbus as possible, but passing through conjunctiva, going through, you know, what's, um, you know, the limbus going through cornea, so all of that is is uh, going to close, um, you know. Once my uh, once my needle has been withdrawn, um, so I, I am avoiding the paracentesis, you know, in that respect, and I'm trying to avoid opening the paracentesis as well. Okay, we have a comment and question from Dr. Dollywall. Great presentation, Dr. Cervantes. Um, <laughs> And he would like to know, have you ever used TPA for fibrin in the AC? Oh, no, I have not. Uh, I have not uh, used fibrin in the AC. Okay, next question is from Dr. Ali. Pertaining to preloaded DMEC graft, is there any issue of directly injecting optazole from the tube into the AC? Um. You know, I've thought about that for a long time, but there's, uh, I don't, I don't think there's, there's any issue. Um, you know, the, the endothelium is already bathing. You know, if you think about it, the endothelium is already bathing in, um, in, um, you know, in the optosol or the life force C. So we know that it's endothelial safe. Um, um, but again, if you uh, spend the time to, you know, dilute it out, um, you know, there's, you uh, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I were you know, another angle of, of answering that question is you know, will the optisol or life force C um, diminish the adherence of the graft to the stroma? Um, but uh, you know, I've, I've not found you know that to be the case or a concern of mine, uh, especially if uh, you know you do end up diluting it out, uh, and uh, you know after performing a large air bubble. 
um, kind of massaging the cornea, you will get rid of a lot of or or a lot of the fluid in the interface, um, you know, with a full air bubble fill. All right. Question from Dr. Jung Lee: Once the graft is centered, do you inject air for complete air fill? for a specific period of time, then reduce to 95%. Yeah, um, I think you're gonna find that, uh, uh, you know, many different, many different DMAC surgeons have their own preferences. Um, because I, uh, um, you know, when I did my fellowship and, and uh, I started out in practice, all I was doing was DMAC. Oh, sorry, all, all I was doing was DSEC. So a lot of my, uh, you know, bubble management, um, you know, habits stemmed from that. So my DSEC bubble management habits were to keep the pressure in the anterior chamber high for like five to eight minutes and then reduce the, uh, during that time, I would use uh, uh, like a Lindstrom roller to massage, you know, and push down on the cornea to squeeze out fluid um, from the interface uh, and then reduce the, uh, the pressure to physiologic pressure for, for, um, you know, another two to five minutes, um, while, while that adheres, um, I sort of do the same thing during DMEC, uh, where I will, um, keep the, the pressure in the anterior chamber high for, you know, two to five minutes, use that time to, again, use a Lindstrom roller to push, you know, fluid and massage fluid out from the interface, uh, for whatever it's worth. Uh, and then bring it back to physiologic pressure, essentially with like a 90, you know, to um, uh, 90, 95% air bubble fill, um, you know, at the very end. Um, so that's essentially my bubble management. Uh, some people will fill the anterior chamber up completely um, to, and just leave it at physiologic pressure and then discharge them from the OR, you know, at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done that a few times and without any problems, but uh, you sort of have to uh, do what you feel comfortable doing. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Ahmed Omar. Excellent presentation as usual. Would like to know how quickly in most cases you expect the visual improvement to happen and how long does it usually take to achieve the desired corneal clarity, completely no edema? Oh, uh, um, this is a, a question that, that patients, you know, you know, love to ask. The, uh, you know, what's, what's really amazing about DMEC is that um, you might start to see corneal clearing um, as soon as week one, you know, where patients come back week one and if the rest of their optical system is great, they might come back 2020, it's incredible. Um, but if, uh, if there are other, you know, problems or if those cells just need some time to perk up, um, you know, uh, you'll start to see clearing, you know, within the first few weeks um, but yet there's still, you know, I tell patients this, you know, there's still clear, uh, clearing and healing, uh, that, um, that might take three to six months, you know, to stabilize or even longer, you know, depending on the level of corneal edema. Um, but, uh, you know, it, once you start doing DMEC, you'll find that the, uh, uh, the clearing is, is really faster, you know, than DSEC. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Huang. When the graft was ejected out of AC, do you use it again or give up? Oh, well, um, I would probably say don't ever give up on a graft because you don't really know how much damage is done. Um, the, uh, you know, I, you know, in that, in that video that I've showed you, I really thought that I had mangled that graft and, you know, you know, squeezed and rubbed it, you know, you know, with my glass injector on the outside of it. Uh, but that graft ended up clearing, you know. Um, again, it's surprising, like, how resilient these grafts are um, to, you know, what we perceive as, as um, you know, severe iatrogenic, you know, excessive manipulation. Um, you know, many of us also don't have eye banks uh, with readily available tissue you know, in the room next door, I know some surgeons are fortunate to have something like that, and I'm not one of those surgeons. So if it's clean, if it's intact, um, if, uh, if you can load it into the injector again uh, safely, um, 
I'd say go for it and uh, and see what happens. You know, what's the worst that would happen? You know, if, if you're uh, if you're not injecting that graft, you're bringing that patient back to the operating room, you know, to put a new one in there. You know, if uh, uh, if you put this graft in there uh, and and it fails, well, it it's failed. Um, but uh, you know, at least you'll be mentally prepared. You know, to uh, you know, uh, you know, to order another graft and and uh, you know, have that discussion with the patient later. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Ali. I have experienced that part of the DMEC graft stuck within the sulcus is difficult to unscroll. Indeed, what will be the best advice dealing with this situation? And how about if bound to happen, part of the graft trapped within the wound? Mm. I um. When part of the graft is stuck in the sulcus, um, meaning behind the iris, I just wanted to clarify that you know, behind the iris. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the most so the uh, the reason why something like that might happen, where the graft gets behind the iris, is that the the pupil is not constricted enough. Um, you can avoid a situation like that by using. Uh, myocol um, just before injection of the graft, you know, to bring that pupil down as tight as possible and have the effect of the myocol as strong as possible just before, you know, injecting the graft. Um, this is also another reason why, uh, why uh, you know, combining cataract surgery with DMAC can be challenging uh, because you need to dilate the pupil to take the cataract out and then you have to use myocol, you know, to bring the pupil back down. But if that pupil doesn't come back down, um, you know, significantly, uh, that's one of the problems that you'd have to worry about, especially in somebody who has a floppy iris. Uh, but once the if if the graft is trapped in the, uh, you know, in the pupil or partially stuck under the iris, um, uh, you there's no physical way to push that graft out with fluid. You physically have to grab it, you know, and if you have intraocular forceps. Uh, that's you know one um, you know you know one way of of uh, you know getting it out of there. Uh, you you know take your intraocular forceps, find a small bite, you know to to hold on to it, a, a small but secure bite, and just pull it back into the anterior chamber. You know you're going to lose a few cells in the, in that spot, um, but if you do it once and you do it well, you know you don't risk losing the entire graft. Um, if it's uh, if it's trapped in the wound, um, you know half in half out, you know sort of situation like I showed you in that video, uh, the best way to deal with that situation is decompress the anterior chamber, so that way it's not forced all the way out. Decompress the anterior chamber, and again, you know just uh, as atraumatically as possible, um, use a blunt instrument to kind of just push it, you know, back into the eye, and then once it's inside the eye, suture it shut. You know, I always suture my incisions shut um, with uh, one single, you know, 10-0 nylon um, as soon as the graft is inside the eye and it's safe and away from the wound. Okay, and we have a que another question from Dr. Jung Lee. Have you seen a graft decenter or fold on itself right after air injection? If so, how did you manage it? If it's decentered or folded, um, the only way to manage that is to get rid of the bubble um, and kind of start over. The, um, the bubble, you know, if the, uh, if the graft is attached to the cornea and a bubble is underneath it, there's surface tension there. You want, you're not going to be able to um, move the graft under a bubble. Uh, so you have to kind of start over, you know, use a, a cannula, draw the bubble out, you know, in drawing the bubble out, the chamber is going to, you know, flatten, which should help keep the graft open. Uh, and, uh, you know, once it's, uh, you know, once there's no more bubble, unfold it like you would have, but you really have to get rid of the bubble and uh, kind of, uh, you know, recenter it under fluid again. Hey, it looks like we don't have any other questions at this time. Uh, I just wanted to make one more mention about the virtual wet lab that's taking place on Saturday, May 22nd. Tonight is the last uh, evening that registration will be open. So if you are interested, you can go to our website and register. 
Um, the registration currently is only open to US-based attendees due to timing, but if you are interested at an international level, please feel, reach, uh, feel free to reach out to someone and we can certainly uh, work something out for you in the near future. I would like to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. The webinar has been recorded and it will be available on our website to view on demand soon. A special thank you to Dr. Cervantes for serving as today's speaker and for providing us with your invaluable expertise on this subject. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you.